Surat sir, we will start the session now. Uh, hi sir, very good morning. Uh, sir, I will just give you here today's uh, session and details, and then I will hand out the session to you, sir. Definitely, sir. Thank you. Oh, sir. So, hello, participants. Very good morning. Uh, now we are on the day two of our uh, Atal sponsored uh, five days national level FTP on revolution and advances in e vehicles. And uh, now today's first session and the session number three is on hybrid and electric vehicles. And this session will be delivered by Mr. Suraj SD, co founder and CEO Decibel Slab, Private Limited, Bangalore. So, Suraj has delivered uh, the session on introduction on e vehicles yesterday. And this is the second session. So, once again, I welcome Mr. Suraj SD to our uh, FTP to deliver the talk on hybrid and electric vehicles. Once again, I welcome you, sir. Thank you. Uh, very good. Uh, very good morning, sir. Thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks for the invite. Um, very good morning, everyone who are present here. Uh, thanks a lot for joining for today's session. Um, I believe yesterday's session has uh, given a perspective of uh, components and subsystems that are present in EV. Uh, as in continuation, I'll I'll drive deeper on other subsystems today. I'll also give a, a fair briefer introduction to hybrid vehicle technology. So that's the agenda of uh, today's uh, 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 session. So let me just share hide my screen and uh, we can begin the discussions. So anybody, if you have any questions from uh, yesterday's uh, uh, discussion. So uh, let's open the floor for uh, quick uh, discussions. Um, so just a recap that you know what we have uh, done yesterday is uh, going through a little bit deeper. So we started with I think uh, maybe participants who have been trying to find the answer. Uh, we, we started with this question that you know how do you justify EVs eco friendly? Um, I I kind of dwell deeper. To give a perspective on you know what kind of emissions that is going to take place uh, by charging an EV and uh, how do we justify with all these emissions that EV is still eco friendly and there are a lot of uh, losses at um, uh, subsystem levels like charging losses, discharging losses, conversion losses, and stuff like that. So um, the question was still open uh, to justify that you know how do we justify EV eco friendly. Oh, uh, we gone a little deeper to understand. Okay, if you want to justify, we have to sort of go through this approach called well doing analysis. This is an answer uh, to the question, but though we we were trying to still understand, okay, how, how does this come uh, into reality still? So we discussed about um, uh, why we're trying to focus on automotive for electrification, not for other applications as well. So we kind of gone a little deeper understanding and then we, we delve deeper on these topics in place. So um, as in continuation, uh, I think I gone through a lot of the slides, uh, which kind of uh, gave you a perspective on subsystems that are present in EV, which are sort of listed uh, here. And um, yeah, uh, if uh, we have also gone through to try to understand the cells and uh, construction in parts of cells that have been uh, dealt here, such as, such as formats of cells. And uh, we also have tried to go through the construction of cells, that is basically the anode, cathode, and uh, the, the construction of a prismatic cell and the construction of a, a cylindrical cell, and uh, like a few other things in place, such as uh, uh, materials, uh, and type of cell chemistries that we have gone through and then further we just touch based on the BMS and requirement of the BMS uh, and the functionalities of a BMS and uh, we were here yesterday uh, to stop our session um, where we um, uh, stopped about uh, uh, finding the next step to uh, start the session today. So any questions till here if anybody have so the floor is open for questions. Um, so uh, you can drop the questions here, or you can also unmute yourself and ask the questions. Cool. Um, if there are no questions, I think we're good to start the session and uh, take ahead for the day. Um, so today I'll be touching on. Uh, 
yeah, hi. Hello, I'm Oracle. Uh, yes, uh, yes, your watch is audible, please. Uh, good morning, sir. Hello. Hi, uh, Hello. good morning. Yeah, good morning, please go ahead. Hello, sir, am I audible? Uh, yes, you are audible. Okay, so my question is that, uh, in India, existing two-wheeler charger control technology used is CCCV method. So, is there any method that improve the charging time of EV? Uh, yes, ma'am. There are a lot of other uh, methods too that are available for uh, charging. Uh, specifically, uh, there are various methods. I have one document that I can share it across. One second, please. Okay. I'm sorry for there's a small disturbance in the back and I'm not sure if it is audible to you. Yeah, uh, there are different approaches, about uh, six different uh, approaches that uh, we have we have strongly identified for the charging. CCCV is a very typical, uh, well-proven uh, approach for a charging. But for the fast charging and all, that may not be very sufficient to handle. So with that cases, we have been uh, approaching some other, you know, uh, things in a way it can be done I, I have a document maybe if you can drop your email id i can share i don't have a presentation right now uh, to share the details uh, but yeah if you can drop me an email i will be able to uh, uh, send that email I, sorry send the document uh, research paper uh, to you okay sir i will drop my email id in chat box Sorry, there's some background noise. Uh, I believe it's not uh, pretty much audible to anyone. Uh, let me begin I with the discussions today. Um, so the first and foremost part of it is the HVAC system. Um, so if you know the HVAC system that I've already detailed uh, in the yesterday's topic, that it takes care of uh, heating, uh, cooling, and uh, uh, ventilation. So if you want to heat the cabin or if you want to cool the cabin, so you would have to um, run a system. If you take any normal uh, IC engine vehicle, uh, there are components which are present here, if you see. So there is a, if you are from a background of mechanical engineering or an automotive, you might have uh, dealt these components, such as like, you know, the evaporator and the condenser. And then there's a compressor and then there's a dryer and receiver. So and then the expansion wall, obviously. So this is the component which actually forms the whole system as a HVAC unit. So, one second. There is somebody. It's free. Can you close that? Sorry. Uh, so coming back to the presentation. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, the HVAC system, if you consider, uh, these are the typical components that comes as a part of the HVAC system. Uh, so if I can kind of redraw re that. So uh, one is a compressor. Uh, second one is a condenser. Uh, third one is an evaporator. Uh, fourth one is basically the dryer and the fifth one is basically the expansion wall. So this is the component that comes as a part of the HVAC system. Now why I'm trying to kind of cover up this HVAC system is uh, it's very important to be uh, have an understanding about this in the part of our EV. Um, 
so before that you know if if you see uh, electric vehicles ic engines the compressor used to be driven by an engine so the crankshaft output is connected to a compressor the compressor is driven by the ic engine then there is a refrigerant the refrigerant is compressed here when you compress the refrigerant uh, it tend to become warmer and that refrigerant is sent to a condenser in a condenser uh, by the exchange it's basically a heat exchanger um, it converts the uh, the phase from uh, 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 vapor to a i would say semi liquid or a part of this phase and then you pass that semi liquid to the evaporator you through an expansion valve when you expand a uh, liquid it it uh, during the phase transformation uh, it tend to um, release in heat and uh, that heat is been captured by the air Uh, which has been blown out here and then blown to a, a, a cabin and then the whole cycle repeats basically there is a dryer and a receiver which kind of take care if there is any moisture in the uh, uh, refrigerant and then that kind of put back into a compressor and this is a whole cycle that happens in the uh, hvac system so it all starts at a compressor so where you have a compressor which is driven by the um, i would say uh, ic engine but the thing is now we don't have ic engines uh, uh, in ev right so then how does the system function the system functions in this way that there is a separate electrical compressor uh that compressor will take care of um uh, compressing the uh, refrigerant so if you see here there is no belt or something like that the motor is sitting inside uh this component itself this is a motor plus compressor uh this component which is basically called as an electrical compressor so that motor and compressor um has to be fed with electricity right it has to be fed with the energy so that energy come from the battery so if you see here uh that is that is a major requirement because hvac system uh load is very large it means it can consume a lot of load the load basically means it can um demand a lot of energy from the battery typically at an average hvac system is somewhere about um 3 to 5 kilowatt or if it is very much optimized uh for the lower performance uh then it is possibly about 2 2 kilowatt at least so 2 kilowatt is a um you know nominal load of any hvac system so if you take this hvac system and then uh, if you if you on this maybe if you let's say you're going on a road and on a city temperature is somewhere about like you know 40 degrees celsius than that day uh, the comfortable human temperature is about like 25 26 degrees celsius so you want to bring down this 40 to 25 25 26 so you definitely turn on the hvac system right so the cooling has to happen if the cooling has to happen the compressor has to run the compressor runs and how does the compressor run the compressor consumes energy from the battery and uh, then it compresses the uh, refrigerant and then the rest of the cycle will remain the same so this is a typical process that happens in the uh, part of the uh, compress uh, sorry the hvac uh, component in the ev so <clears throat> this is this is how it it happens and on the other side you also have to take care of uh, the heating systems imagine that day maybe you're in a delhi or some other parts of the country where the temperature possibly has dropped to let's say uh, 10 degrees celsius so if it has dropped to 10 degrees celsius it, it's very uncomfortable for somebody to live in 10 degrees celsius so you would have to bring up the temperature from 10 to 25 26 so it's about a 15 degree temperature in rise that is a requirement so how do you make that happen if you have an ic engine uh, what can happen is there is a there is a coolant that is present inside the engine right which is taking care of the cooling process so there's a coolant which is basically circulating inside the engine uh, which is con- which is carrying out a cooling activity so uh, right it's engine cooling so engine cooling is happening uh, because uh, we have to cool the engine so it means this coolant is carrying the heat uh from the combustion so that heat is is carried out basically that uh, you know coolant a part of the coolant uh 
is going to a radiator which is basically mounted in the front of the engine right and then the part of the coolant is going to the other circuit basically which is which take care of releasing some amount of heat from the engine cooling system to the cabin system uh, i believe i am able to uh, give an uh, clarity so if it is a cooling and then there is a heating for the cooling we use a refrigeration cycle so where we have a compressor and then we have a condenser radiator evaporator um condenser and evaporator and also the expansion valve but if you take a heating system so how do you heat the cabin you need to have a source to heat the cabin right so if you want to have a source you, we have a source from the engine cooling so the engine has a heat because it is constantly burning the fuel and um, we are trying to cool the engine because we sh- we don't want to overheat the engine because the material properties have limited range because if you try to go above specific uh, temperature then uh, the metal uh, materials that are used in the uh, engine block or possibly in any other things may have a thermal expansion that is quite bad if you create a thermal expansion so you always trying to limit the temperature within the specific value that um, you know you can actually uh, retain the material properties so that is why you're doing engine cooling so when the engine is being cooled how how does it cool basically you have a coolant that is going into the engine uh, being warm and coming out of the engine being cold like coming out of the engine carrying out the heat so it is going in, in cold i'm sorry and then coming out uh, circulating inside the engine it will carry out the heat from the engine and then it will come out and then it goes to a radiator right so it goes out warm here and then it comes out uh, colder right it goes in warm and it comes out colder so where we have a heat exchanger which is basically a system then you have a fan uh, in some cases so the f- definitely it is required in most of the cases uh, obviously because the car is moving it also have the air that is flowing on top of the radiator so these are the things which happens and then that basically cools the uh, engine so if you if you take this example here that the heat is carried by the radiator and this heat which you what you are trying to do is you are trying to release the heat to our atmosphere okay so you are trying to release the heat to our atmosphere but what if you put another system from here and then release that heat into a cabin right you may you don't need a big radiator but you need a small radiator um so you just pass the air on top of it uh, then the heat is being carried to our atmosphere sorry cabin right so this is how the basically the the engine cooling happens or a or a cabin heating happens so any questions on that engine cooling or engine heating anyone have questions all right um no questions as of now cool um so now i'll explain about the cooling system how does the cooling system works in ev so basically there is everything is same the only thing which varies is the compressor this compressor is an additional component um that comes as a part of it so why is it important because if you turn on the air conditioning system that is ac your vehicle is going to give you a lesser range because you are trying to consume some part of the energy from the battery which is supposed to go to the motor uh to an electrical compressor right so as i was mentioning the size is about 2 kilowatt for a passenger car segment maybe for a bus it is about like a 10 kilowatt okay so this amount of load maybe this is a you know peak load if you consider a nominal load of 1 kilowatt if you are running the compressor for a 1 hour you are consuming about a 1 kilowatt of energy it means if the battery is 10 kilowatt you are consuming about like a 10% of the energy for the hvac system that is for the cooling requirements so this is the the load that the compressor can act on the battery pack it means we need to think about even how many hours customers can turn on the ac if you see in many cases that you know uh, when a when a company promises uh, 250 kilometers range uh, in a single charge 
but if the temperature on that day is very very high maybe if you consider let's say uh, 40 degrees celsius obviously customer has turned on the air conditioning system right so it means the, the air conditioning system is running at a full load maybe if it is running at about a 2 kilowatt full load right it means on that day it, it has consumed even 10% more than what it is supposed to consume and then obviously the the only source of energy is battery if the battery is going to drain and obviously it impacts the range of the vehicle so that's one of the thing and then apart from this we also have a heating system all right so because i explained uh, in detail in the last slide that uh, the cabin heating can be done by engines uh, cooling system but in i in an electric vehicle we don't have the heat that will be available instantly to heat the cabin right because we don't have an ic engine <clears throat> in that case we use something called ptc heater and it's an electrical heater uh, it's called as a ptc heater it is typically like an electrical heater but it is little more efficient than what general electric heaters we use in our home applications but in a typically a similar way so this heater is again fed with the energy from the battery and that energy is being circulated over the heater circuit because of the resistance of the heater then the the energy being converted into a heat and then if you pass either a liquid or a air on top of this you can have a different type of heat exchanger right liquid to air air to liquid or liquid to liquid or air to air type of a heat exchanger systems so again that is a architecture def- definition what kind of uh, heat exchanger which you want to design uh, because um, you also have to carry some other architecture systems along with the uh, existing one so this is another component which comes as a part of the ev which is not there in ic engines apart from it obviously we have pumps in uh, ev uh, ic engine also but we have pumps in uh, uh, evs also there is no much of a big difference um, Uh, here in together so uh here is a larger representation um i'll just close and open this back yeah if you see here there's a larger representation of the system you know, which has been put here so there is a battery which is basically a, our energy storage device then we have a heater system this is a ptc heater so the energy is been fed the ptc heater which is basically electrical energy right so that goes in here then it has been fed into a ptc heater so ptc heater is controlled by a ecu which is called as body control module so it is basically giving a signal to the ptc heater that the value of i it should draw the value of i means value of current the the ptc heater should draw if it is draw more a current then the more heat is being generated right if it is draw less current then the less heat is being generated so it is defined by your system requirements maybe what is the temperature requirements at a core so depending upon that you can draw a lot of current or a less amount of current so now what happens okay now the the heater is on and then it is drawing an x value of current and then the the it is warmed up now what we can do is we can have a pump which is basically an electrical pump then the pump will supply the coolant then coolant will have an exchange of heat with the ptc heater this is cold but when it interacts with the ptc heater it carries the heat that is in the ptc heater uh, further ahead when it carries the heat further ahead then there is a sensor here which takes the feedback to identify the temperature of the coolant um if it is low then obviously it asks the ptc heater to draw more current if the temperature is too high then the ptc heat draws less current this is basically a control system which is sitting inside this small module of electronics then there is a heat exchanger which is basically an electric core you supply that uh, warm coolant inside this one and then you put a fan here right when you put a fan here the fan blows the air the air will carry the heat that is present in the heater core and then that supplies the air to the cabin all right and then the 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 coolant becomes cold and then it comes back here it goes to a reservoir and then from there it comes down and then it goes to the pump again and this whole circulation system keeps running and keeps running until your um heating system is turned off 
so it's very important to understand you know these things because uh, i may try to give a little deeper definition on how advanced tesla or any other companies are trying to do they're trying to do something called as a heat pump it's a new technology uh, not a new technology but it is there for many years but uh, tesla has extensively used that they they are trying to eliminate this component completely they're trying to use the heat from the motor they're trying to use the heat from the battery uh, to to supply the heat to a cabin it means the heat that is being pumped out to a ca- atmosphere is being captured and then supplied to a utilization requirements so it, it's it's a very interesting thing and um, you know these are some components that comes as a part of the hvac system that is like uh, this is the images that are you know present so this is what the electrical compressor looks like i might have already shown these images so um yeah this is a uh, a ptc heater you can see this one how does it look like so uh, slightly in larger so you you supply uh, the current into this uh, then it it produces heat because of resistance then you supply a coolant and then you ask the coolant to draw a heat out of it so then there are some components which are typically the pumps and stuff like that so the floor is open for questions if you have any questions uh, so please ask any questions anyone have any questions regarding the discussions that we have done you know what kind of re- possible research that can be done is you know uh, you can there are a lot of research papers also available uh, in the largely in the internet that you know you can study the load of hvac system uh, on the battery uh, uh, energy so if example you, you turn on the hvac system then how much of energy will be consumed by the battery um, there are a lot of simulation tools you can use like matlab and you can perform studies uh, you can check like with respect to your state your region your vehicle size what can be the energy consumed uh, at the battery pack right so all these things can be studied uh, there's a lot of quite extensive uh, publications available by various part universities also maybe for a bus or a or a uh, electric car or a suv or something like that so the, the what will be the impact of load from the hvac system on the battery and that impact again is varied with respect to various atmospheric conditions such as temperature at the atmospheric condition or maybe the load required like the, the temperature settings for the customer and things like that so in continuation to the, the the topic we had so there are some more components which is we already discussed here which is a hvac system then we also have a braking system you know you might have uh, driven cars right so um when you, when you, when, your, when your car is parked you try to press a brake the brake will can be pressed once or twice if you press the brake for third time the brake become too hard i think you might have uh, you know experienced this phenomenon uh, that is typically in all the the hydraulic braking systems uh i'm 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 sure you might have uh, felt yourself that uh, try to press a brake if the car should be turned off and uh, you press a brake and then the the brake get pressed once or twice and then after that it becomes too hard right so because it is a vacuum assisted system the braking is a vacuum assisted system the vacuum is in the engine uh because of the suction stroke so you utilize that part of the vacuum and you try to support that system um for the braking i'm i'm not sure if you're able to follow follow me upon this but if you, if you know have an exposure to a braking system you may be able to kind of get an exposure in, on this so there is a there is a small connection that comes from the engine to a braking system 
so it means the engine was playing a role also in the braking of the vehicle so now the engine is not there so you have to have a small uh, electrical uh, a vacuum assist system for the brake so that's the other component that also comes as a part of your uh, ev which is not there in uh, ic engines obviously the steering systems uh, steering system is to get a power supply from the the auxiliary battery and now you you get a power supply from the dc dc converter obviously all these systems which are there in ev ic engines they are also there in the evs so they all form together as an auxiliary systems and uh, which means that they all will act as a load uh, on the battery and uh, objective of an engineer is to also consider the energy consumed by all these systems uh, to be uh, uh, designing a battery pack so we can go ahead for the the battery uh, cooling and battery heating uh, we're just checking out if there is any questions uh, in the chat box <clears throat> all right so um going ahead yeah the battery cooling and battery heating so why do we require a battery cooling and why do we require battery heating so uh the the very important functionality can be explained with uh, one of the graph which i uh, kind of described in the the part of this okay cool so uh why do we require battery cooling or battery heating because you know they can be a cooling system but why do we require that battery or battery heating or cooling system so we know the heat is being generated so how does the heat get generated when you draw a current out of the cell right yeah, this is a cell let's say lithium ion cell this is positive and this is negative when you draw a current out of the cell the reactions are going to happen inside a cell these reactions are exothermic right so this reactions release heat and this heat get accumulated and forms a temperature right the rise in temperature so what happens if you if you do not bother about temperature so what happens is the cell has a specific behavior with respect to temperature imagine this is a cell cell characteristics this is a typical cell characteristics which we call it as so this is voltage this is soc uh this is 100% soc this is 0% soc maybe this is 2.8 volts and this is 4.2 volts so this characteristic graph is only present if you draw an x amount of current at a specific temperature if you draw x plus 1 slash t plus then it means the more amount of current at a higher temperature then the cell is going to exhibit an other characteristic graph something like this so it means the area under this curve represent the energy that you can capture so there is a loss of loss of energy which is being not consumed in this region just because the temperature of the cell is different so the meaning is the the if you do not keep the cell within its temperature limits then the cell is going to exhibit a different characteristics because it's a chemistry which is happening inside a cell and the cell is subjected to a temperature and the characteristic behavior of the cell is going to change so why exactly it is going to change it is possibly because of kinetics of the reaction basically as a chemistry so the the movement of ions uh, or or the the feasibility of um, electrolyte to carry a accelerated reaction or a uh, uh, or any of the even active materials to engage in reaction would possibly reduce or it would, would increase so that creates the increase in resistance or lowering the reactions then you will have a bad performance from the cell so the objective of the cooling system is to retain the battery or a cell within a permissible limit either on the lower side or on the higher side okay that is why we require a cooling system for the the battery so yeah, anyone have any questions
all right no questions cool so what happens is um the cooling the battery is a very complicated phenomenon imagine you have about like a 7000 cells and each of the cells are packaged uh in terms of modules i will definitely show like a de better images uh than this imagine this is a one module i'm sorry okay i'll just try showcasing uh a one more image uh, which can be uh, better visualized by anyone <clears throat> yeah so if you see here this is like a typical architecture that is for there for the cooling so you have cells so the coolant comes in and goes out and comes in and goes out this is one of the module like there are a lot of modules like this yeah all of these modules has to be cooled and it's a very complicated approach uh, to cool all these systems uh, at the same time if you see here um, the coolant is going through uh, these pipes which are present here maybe if i try to show this as an image video I'm sorry about uh, this introduction. Uh, so basically, there's a there's extensive cooling system. All right. So um, coming back, so basically, it's a very complicated system that you have to engage in designing the whole thermal management system. uh it is it is even more complicated than an ic engine because ic engine has more rugged nature for the temperature even like there is a variation in 5 degree uh temperature the engine is okay to start it is it is not that it it, it get impacted with its performance though it is to a certain level but it is manageable it doesn't impact to its you know the engine block behavior or something like that but if you subject a cell uh always to a lower temperature or always to a higher temperature then the cell life will tend to come down it means it's a permanent behavior loss or a characteristic loss for the cell which means that if you do not have a proper cooling system then the cell life is going to be impacted and that's the the take away from the uh the cooling requirements so because it's very uh complex and it is also a requirement that you need to have the system to perform cooling so that means that you know it is going to be uh, highly uh, uh complex and sensitive in nature so we have various different approaches for cooling i will try to show you in the the detailed presentation but this is just a overview to understand the subsystem uh so you also have to perform not only cooling but also perform heating the requirement of heating is if you are in the countries like europe or us the temperature can drop up to like 0 degree celsius or minus 10 degree minus 5 degree celsius even if it is scandinavian countries like sweden or norway the temperature can even go lower so in those conditions what happens is the battery also cools down a lot so imagine if you park your car outside the house and on the overnight uh the there is a snowfall and the temperature has dropped to uh let's say like you know -5 degree celsius then your battery temperature is also at -5 or -10 degree celsius that means if you turn on the car at that time then the cell will have a lower temperature that would be a problem for the cell because the cell's performance will be bad not only at that time it would tend to impact its life for a overall way why does it happen there are a lot of problems if you try to operate a cell at a lower temperature we call it a lithium plating or also there are various different phenomena that happens at a lower temperature so it is not safe for the cell so you have to have a heating system so that you can heat the battery pack 
before you start to run the vehicle all right so this is a requirement why we have the cooling system and the heating system so the question comes is um you are doing an engine cooling so engine cooling there is an engine and then there is a radiator there is a radiator and then there is an engine so obviously there is some device like a fan so uh oh god all right so there is an engine and then there is a radiator hello sir sir your presentation is not visible oh is it so how long it has been now now itself sir somebody has shared their screen that's why it has gone oh, okay i thought my internet got disconnected okay i request all participants not to share anything on the screen and also not to turn off your turn on your videos okay it's okay kindly requested <coughs> sorry sir so um so this is a uh, radiator and then this is an engine we're talking about a cooling of the engine so this is a mechanism we have studied there's a fan here or something like that so you're dumping the heat from the engine to an atmosphere by a radiator and a force to a fan but how do you cool the battery so the the problem is uh the cooling is not as simple as what we have to dump the you know heat into the atmosphere so we need to have a complete different system all in place uh, to carry out the the cooling so actually what we do is in in reality we share the like energy from the compressor that is basically the hvac system we 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 combine the battery cooling with the hvac system's energy so that you can cool the battery there is also a possibility that we can combine the hvac system's heating with the battery heating so which means i mean it's it's slightly challenging to understand i agree because on the day one it, it's just too much it's basically a system architecture design so if you are a if you are a vehicle manufacturer you might this all the systems that are present there is a hvac system the requirement is you need to cool the cabin or you need to heat the cabin then you have a battery system you need to cool the battery or heat the battery then we have a motor we need to cool cool the motor we don't need to heat the motor right then we have a power tonics power electronics which is basically like a motor controller dc dc converter chargers and all these things all of them has to be cooled here the system requirement is basically the air the cabin you are not supplying a water or a coolant into the cabin right we are we want the air to take care of cooling or take care of heating as a end source if you take a battery so either you can do a air cooling which may not be very effective you can do a liquid cooling which may be effective but it is complicated right the motor cooling either you can do a air cooling or you can do a liquid cooling again air cooling is not efficient but liquid cooling is efficient but it is very complicated in place right and also the the power tonics either you can do a air cooling or a liquid cooling so when you have this requirement in place you need to design a system so the first and foremost source is where do you get the heat from right or which system can provide you the energy absorption or energy release right so we have an hvac system which is basically having a cooling cooling effect and a heating it it's it should have an heating effect too right 
cooling is done to compressor heating is done to ptc heater so what happens if you want to perform a heating you need to integrate a system which is basically a ptc heater with the battery heater the problem is is it a liquid based system hvac requires a air based system but a battery requires a liquid based system if so we are not going for air cooling system air heating air, air based uh, heating or cooling right if this becomes a very complex approach to define your system architecture so uh, like we engineers work on uh, uh, like identifying what is the requirement of the system should i go for a liquid cooling should i go for air cooling that's the first question you need to address in the room uh, if you go for a liquid cooling then it's fairly complex if you go for air cooling it's not efficient so how do you define today 99% of all the vehicles uh, which is four wheeler vehicles all typically have a liquid cooling system so because air cooling is not sufficient to carry out the heat from the uh, battery pack so putting all together it the, the major question comes is like that what kind of heat exchanger that i should use is it a liquid to air or air to liquid or liquid to liquid or air to air or what kind of system is that and when you select it which one is more efficient right so this all the things comes up comes in part of a air cooling or a liquid cooling system and uh, the motor cooling motor cooling is a very important thing because the motor's efficiency i think if you are from electrical you may know this that the efficiency of the motor depends upon three parameters one is a motor speed motor torque and motor temperature so these are three parameters which impacts the uh, efficiency of the motor If the efficiency of the motor is too bad, it means it draws a lot of current, right? So it becomes highly uh, important to have the cooling system for the motor. If you do not cool the motor, then obviously you may end up uh, destroying the motor because the magnets that are present inside a motor will lose their properties if you subject them to a higher temperature. but right. that's the typical characteristics of the the magnets if you constantly expose them to a higher temperature they lose their magnetism so it is important that you do not uh, overheat the motor so we also have to cool the motor in the same way so cooling the motor is a very complex phenomenon because it is it is having a very very compact shape and design so you need to make a passage for the coolants to flow in and flow out right for that to happen it's a lot of engineering that need to be taken care of so engineers from electrical and mechanical background does a lot of iterations of designs and then take care of designing a cooling system so obviously i think i i touch based on all these things but it's a six sensor list of components with a part of the auxiliary systems so if you have any questions still here on the battery heating or a motor battery heating battery cooling or a motor heating i can touch base you on that any questions from anyone okay so i will try finding uh, okay what were the opportunities in computer science engineer for contributing in ev that's a very good question uh computer science engineering contributing what exactly we can uh, apply artificial intelligence and machine learning concepts uh, in particularly in the ev uh mr umesh kundar uh the the extensive opportunities for computer science engineers is majorly where uh the systems are behaving non linear in nature so typically in application like a battery management system uh where the cell behavior is very erratic and non linear in nature so in this conditions we have we can actually gather a lot of data using that data if we can predict the future behavior of the cell that's a fantastic idea so that is where we see some applications of computer science so where it is basically about uh battery management system algorithms motor control algorithms or also <clears throat> to design a charging system infrastructure we need a digital infrastructure right 
for example all the payments like if you go to a charging station you need to charge the car or a bike so you go and put the plug just system doesn't function so you need to have a lot of it infrastructure in the back end which is payment authentications and stuff like that which ensures the payment is done or maybe in a mobile application development and things like that so this is some of the areas where not only machine learning but in general as a computer science application development and all these things can be done uh, as a computer science engineer um so in two wheelers also required cooling system for the battery it's a good question definitely uh, the cooling system would be required for a two wheelers also uh, if you want to go for a fast charging because the fast charging would increase the temperature of the battery drastically high all right so if you want to let's say the battery temperature is 40 degrees celsius imagine the atmospheric temperature is 41 the battery is 40 if you ch- do a fast charging obviously the battery temperature will shoot up above 60 degrees celsius that is not good for the battery right so again the requirement is always based on your system performance or how do you want to operate your system at so that's the key takeaway of the question uh in india okay to read us required cooling system i think i answered the question uh all right okay uh i i'm not really a subject matter expert in the charging or power electronics obviously uh, maybe there are subject matter experts who are delivering the upcoming sessions um in the next days so kindly do interact with them please so apart from this i want to sort of showcase some of the images that i've collected uh for you uh just give me a second here i will i'll just try to open that and uh uh showcase that Surat sir, your mic is muted. Oh, sorry sir. So um, there are some uh, battery uh, cooling system. I have delivered one of the session. It's about ten hours only on cooling system that is present on our platform. Uh, if somebody is interested to go a little deeper on uh, cooling systems and uh, stuff like that, but though I call it as a very basic session because uh, cooling system is a very complicated topic. going deeper uh, would require a lot of time but i i've tried to do it delivering one of the lectures on that uh, there is a course if somebody is interested on our platform so if you see here um the the coolant inlets and outlets you know on a practicality what i kind of want to deliver is like um i know it feels like you know it's just the system and you know what is there to emphasize but it is not just a system it is a very very complicated uh, engineering activity that any company does it's like you know this this design is about might have taken them about like at least like a 5 8 years of a iterative cycle it is not a one time design that you know you get a design and it's it's all freezed they might have developed a system identified problems improved it then identified problems improved it then they would have come to this shape which which can be still improvised over the generation of vehicles So if you see here that you know there is a there is a water like the water glycol is a mixture which is typically used as a coolant that comes here and then there is a typically a very unique type of a, a, a cooling channel you know which I can uh, try to showcase here if you see yeah so this is a cooling channel the coolant comes in here and goes through these channels how does the channel look like 
i think if you, if you clearly observe here uh yeah so if you clearly observe here right so there are paths through which the coolant is entering from that side the coolant enters from this side right so it goes all the way through the channel it goes all the way through the channel but how does exactly it goes it goes through some of this small tinier uh, passages so this is the cells basically like cylindrical cells so the heat that is there inside this uh, cylindrical cells are carried away by this heat exchanger all right they call micro channel for a coolant flow so they will take away the heat from the cab from the that am batteries or cells so these are the materials again as i said the structural rigidity becomes very very important so to make that happen it is completely foam filled and this foam is also thermally conductive that it absorbs the heat all over the cell and it lets the coolant path to absorb that heat so that the heat is taken out from the the battery pack so like in similar there are a lot of complicated systems that are also present but yeah this is another part of the presentation itself so uh let's go back we just want to show you that you know this is how uh the the cooling system would look like that is also an heating system too uh, both are same uh, in that big architecture all right so uh any questions from anyone all right no questions we see right now <laughs> Uh, okay uh, so i'll i'll just touch base on some more components that are present in ev uh then some of the vehicle architecture that kind of uh, touch base is my objective of the session so it's a uh, 1025 um if you're comfortable um i think we can take a 10 minutes break because it's quite difficult for me also to deliver a, a continuous session for about 2 hours uh if we will be back here at uh 10:35 uh we can continue upon some more slides where i'll be able to touch base and uh, showcase some of the little deeper insights of the ev subsystem that is on the charger side of it and also on the advanced uh, technological sides and vehicle architecture uh, and things like that so um so let's take a break for 10 minutes uh it's 10:26 right now so we'll be catching back here at 10:35 so i'll mute myself until then so if you have any questions um uh, so if you have any questions please drop them in the chat box
All uh, right, so I think yeah, we still have two minutes uh, to start the uh, session. Uh, let's just look into some of the questions uh, from participants. Um, yeah, so what is the material used for making uh, channels for cooling? Uh, it's typically aluminum. Uh, that's been a standard material. Um, that's for majorly all the cooling system. But yeah, they can be a very specific uh, material grade um, or material type that can be uh, uh, used. Um, I'm not very sure what many OEMs exactly uses uh, the material configuration, but it largely can be named as aluminum. Uh, if like many any of the available vehicles can be brought and they can be you know tested to identify a specific material. Uh, so I want to do some courses at Decibels Lab. Uh, what kind of things do you suggest? So um, 
if you are looking for a program in place then you can uh, typically look for uh, programs from decibel lab such as on ev uh, so if you go down here we have some programs that are specifically for um uh, paratonics that would be on uh, uh paratonic components design or a motor controller design and also the bldc motor controller design and also we are also coming up with uh, hardware design such as a hard hardware design you can also like look forward to take part in them so any other questions from anyone Uh, right, so no questions. We should be good to start our sessions. All right. So um, as a part of the next uh, things, which is basically the charger configurations. So we have various different uh, levels of charging, which is called as, I uh, already tried to brief these things uh, before, the concept of onboard charging and offboard charging yesterday. So the onboard charger is this, offboard charger is this, right? So the onboard charging is very slow, which is typically an AC type of charging. Halfboard charging is slightly faster in rate, and that could be like, you know, up to 100 to 150 kilowatt. I mean, this is, I'm mentioning, per hour. So this is like a huge uh, uh, possibility for a quick charging. But here we have a limited amount of source so that you know you, you can't basically go for a faster charging. So that according to some standards defined by SAE, we call them as level one, level two, and level three charging. Level one and level two are slow charging are also called as an AC charging. Level three is called as a fast charging. So I think it's just defined like a little in detail here. Uh, that is what I was trying to explain. So these are some typical uh, values that it would be mentioning here. So if you take a, a specific charger, which is about Hello, sir. Hello. Can you hear me, sir? You are not audible. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure when the meeting got disconnected. Apologies for that. All right. So uh, let's get back. I uh, was trying to step down here. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not sure where did I stop. Uh, if somebody can just help me out, um, I can like kind of cover up some of the topics which I might have skipped. Um, so I think I mentioned about an onboard charging and a half-board charging. The onboard charging is typically called as AC charging. According to some standards by SAE, we call level one and level two charging are a slow charging. Level three charging is called as a fast charging. So uh, this is a, like a details which we have drafted 
if you take a battery of 24 kilowatt how much time does it take to charge using uh, a typical level 1 and level 2 chargings so it will take about 7 to 20 hours if it is a level 1 it will take about uh, 8 to 20 hours if it is level 2 it can only take about 30 minutes to 40 minutes if it is fast charging but though fast charging has not just a limitation but also uh, some challenges in terms of battery cooling uh, it also has some challenges in terms of uh, uh, the, the cell limitations it also has some charges that you should have a specific charging port charging protocol and uh, your vehicle should be compatible for fast charging a lot of these things will come into a picture right so um, but that's the typical way and there are some standards uh, that are used by various companies or various countries so if you see the chadmo is typically a, uh, a japanese approach and uh, gbt and then iec ieee and sae they all define some standards for charging sae has released typical type of uh, plugs that are suitable for uh, ev application the thing is um it's it's not still like universal that everybody uses sae j1772 um some companies use j1 j1772 or some companies use chadmo some companies use gbt some companies use css so it's not like a very standardized and fixed right now like in how we have electrical circuits in india so like for all the sockets are typically round round shape right so it means there is no other socket that is like a square or a, some other shapes in place so it is circular in way so and there is specific pitch and a uh, size locations and all all the stuff so like that we still not standardized in ev but there are various different types of chargers uh ports so this is a specific uh, uh type of a charger plug that is for level 1 and level 2 and this is for the level uh 3 that is basically uh dc fast charging the css is called combined charging standards the are a combined charging system the advantage of css is you can do slow charging you can also do a fast charging it means you can do a level 1 level 2 and level 3 all three levels of a charging you can carry out okay so that is with the css like in similar we have some iec standards for charging the charging connector for the iec and also for the the fast charging connector so all these are uh, type of plugs that you can connect so again we have a chadmo so chadmo is a specific uh, charging standard uh, designed by a specific manufacturer so a lot of companies have adopted chadmo because of the availability of plugs and also the cost of charger and you know the cost of uh, technology so um it is it has been very well proven a lot of vehicle manufacturers have already been using if you take a mahindra they also have a chadmo uh plug in their vehicle architecture so they have their the, all these plugs may look very simple but they have very complex uh very detailed uh, uh arrangements of uh, data communication safety uh you know a uh, a uh, a way the couple and there are sensors also that ensures that the the connection is always there a lot of these things happen in between the charger and the the battery or a vehicle ecu inside the car so um that's a uh, a very brief in terms of a uh, subsystem as a charger so then we can go a little deeper into the other components There are different methods. If you have any questions on those topics, uh, let's open up. Okay, no questions seems to be here. So let's switch back. So. as a part of the charging some of the companies are trying to approach in innovative way such as a um, company called sono motors which i already 
described in one of the last uh, yesterday's uh, uh, question that um, the company is trying to adopt solar panel technology to charge the EV. Um, it's still not in the market, but though they have potentially proven that it is possible, and they have been already testing the vehicles in the market too. So then there is also a wireless charging. Like in phones, we already see the wireless chargers. The same way, the, the the wireless charging is also planning to be introduced for EV. But the the battery for a phone is very small. Maybe it's like five thousand mAh or six thousand mAh. But the battery for a EV is like at least about like twenty kilowatt or twenty five kilowatt. It means it's very large. That means the the cost. It will be very, uh, sorry, not the cost, the complexity of the system is also going to be very high. But yeah, people are experimenting and they're trying it out. So the one important thing is about an uh, architecture which are present in EVs. So different companies use different architecture. So uh, if you see here, this is a 360 volt, this is an 800 volt and a 1000 volt, and this is about a 51 volt, right? So uh, there are different voltage ratings if you are from a power electronics background or if you are from a if you are from a uh, system engineering or if you are a vehicle architect it is very important to figure out okay what is this the value of voltage you know that you want to fix so if you see here the operating voltage is 360 but for the other truck it's about 800 and it's about 1000 volts the battery pack size is a value that depends upon the range of the vehicle that you want to expect. All right. And if you see the, the, the range is like uh, relatively in a pack size and a vehicle size. Right. So if you take a scooter applications, it's about like a 51 volt or even up to somewhere about 72 volts for a scooters. If you take a bikes or if you take a super bikes and all the voltage can even go up to like you know, 350 or 320 or something like that. So the the because if you select a battery voltage the battery voltage is customizable okay because you have like a configuration of cells and things like that but the problem is your bms should be available the charger should be available the motor control should be available the dc dc converter should be available so all these things put together will forms the selection of voltage value or a voltage rating you know for the uh, for the vehicle architecture so that's kind of a very important thing uh, selecting a vehicle or a voltage architecture for a very specific vehicle requirement. If you select a voltage which is very low, then you have to opt for a higher current. The higher current is very bad uh, if you want to operate uh, for the vehicle requirements. So you always tend to uh, choose the, you know, the, the voltage higher. But the problem is if you select a voltage higher, then the issue is that uh, the the Handling a higher voltage is also a challenging thing, right? Because you have safety regulations uh, can be called as a higher voltage above 60. So then it becomes a problem uh, if you do not have a proper uh, safety architecture for higher voltages. So it's always like an egg and chicken. Uh, you want to bring this up and other things goes out of the control. And this, you want to bring this in the control, other things goes out of the control. So the, but though the, the architecture is always chosen in the right way because all your subsystems work at a specific voltage. So some companies approaches the systems of assembly in a different way. If you consider the Nissan Leaf, they have everything in the front of the car. Okay, the motor, motor controller, and the power distribution unit, and the charger. Everything is in one 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 single assembly. All right. But if you take Tesla, they have motor and motor controller integrated at a rear wheel. They also have an all-wheel drive configuration. Okay, so then if you consider a BMW i3, they also have configuration which is similar to uh, Nissan Leaf. So the configuration of where do you put a motor, where do you put a battery, how many, how much of the battery you put, uh, what exactly the architecture of the uh, systems do you use as charger or, or controller and things like that. It's all a, uh, again, a complicated engineering because uh, it should be scalable in place. Tomorrow, 
not uh, tesla can make different different positioning for motors so if they have five models they don't want to change any of this architecture which is outside they just want to only modify this motor that we can increase its performance or something like that right so there are again a various architectures so uh, so i think this is a uh yeah uh, incorrect uh, wording so this is architecture by uh, tata motors and the hyundai and then also by volkswagen id4 um if you consider for a traction motors you see like a uh, the non hub motor configuration and ultra variety is also having a non motor configuration and the uh, the new hummer that is an ev that is also having a non motor configuration so that's a very brief in terms of uh, system architecture and also the the voltage architecture of uh, an ev so if you have any questions uh, please do drop them here uh, it would be glad to discuss those queries and move ahead looks like no questions uh, anybody would like to have any questions from your side all right so um then we can move ahead to another part of the discussion which is basically the hybrid vehicles i'm sure it's like a lot of information kind of being fed in a very short span but though with availability in a format of a session so uh, i i couldn't help much So if there's any feedbacks, so I'm always open to listen. Uh, then giving a feedback by end of the class, at end of the course, there is nothing much to be improved. You can share inputs as I was asking yesterday, that I could make some changes for today's session. So if there's still an half an hour left, I believe, yeah. Uh, if you still have any inputs uh, that you want me to cover, I can definitely try doing that uh, in the given time. Uh, any questions or? anything that you want from your side so please let me know <clears throat> all right so if uh, no questions for now we'll go ahead for the hybrid vehicle technology as a part of it so uh, as part of the hybrid uh, systems in place you know it's i'm not a very great fan of hybrids um, because of the complexity of the systems and also the cost of the systems if the system is very complex it is it tend to prone for failures all right it means it will have a problems of failure that is a typical nature as a characteristic for any um complex systems um you can call as a redundant redundant nature system basically all right so uh, when you consider a hybrid the let's understand why do we require hybrids and what is hybrids So typically, if you consider this, there's an engine here. Then there is a, a motor generator. You, let's remove these th these components, right? So if you want to drive the vehicle, so it's pretty simple that you know you have an engine, then you have a transmission, all right, and then you have a final drive. So the engine runs, and then the transmission runs, and then the final drive runs. So this is a typical way how an IC engine is present, right? So why we require a hybrids in place? So the hybrids is basically a version of Uh, a possibility to improve the efficiency of a system all right so the to improve an efficiency something that you can do is to uh, find the possibility where the energy is being wasted and then we try to capture that part of the energy all right that part of the energy uh, that we can uh, uh, capture and then we can utilize it that's the concept of hybrids so uh, how does it work let's let's kind of go and uh, look into little possibilities where the energy is being wasted all right so one of the reason is let's say you are in the traffic light all right so if you are a traffic light so the engine is on most of the cases but the vehicle is not running the engine is on the vehicle is not running 
the vehicle is not moving right so the energy from the engine is being wasted though there's an let's say there's a hvac system is being on okay the hvac system is basically the cooling system right imagine you are at a traffic light temperature is too high you turn on the ac right the ac is running so but that's why the engine is also on but though the part of the energy is being wasted right so there is some amount of possibility to capture the energy i believe you agree right then if you are breaking the vehicle so the engine breaking so vehicle breaking so when you are breaking the vehicle are you pressing the accelerator no you are not pressing the accelerator the accelerator pedal is zero and uh, the the vehicle uh, only the brake is pressed but the engine is still running right the engine is on but the accelerator is zero there is no requirement by the engine to move the vehicle right so there is a loss of energy in this condition then there is a third scenario like vehicle is going down the hill okay when the vehicle is going downhill so what is happening is um the energy is being uh, like you're not trying to typically press an accelerator when you're going downhill right because the vehicle doesn't require a lot of uh, like you know the push uh, from the engine so because of the inertia it is trying to move uh, on its own right so the engine is still on but the accelerator is zero you're trying to burn the fuel without actually a need of the requirement right so this is some typical scenarios which are very straight forward that you know where we are trying to uh, waste the energy but you can capture the energy and reuse it again but if you have an ic engine there is no possibility that you know you can you reuse the energy because there is no option right but if you if you take another example on the other side uh, i think if you are from you know maybe looked into an engines little detail there is something called as a specific fuel consumption sfc right so um, the the engine torque and engine rpm so if you if you draw a graph something like this so the engine has its specific uh, maximum torque and a maximum rpm the engine cannot go no more than that defined values right so um, then there is a value called sfc specific fuel consumption the thing is uh, according to definition this is sfc curve let's say this is a, a motor torque sorry the ic engine torque and this is a rpm all right so um, there is a defined region that engine operates highly efficient okay highly efficient so why does it operate highly efficient it's again a very complex uh, understanding that the design of an engine is subjected to a constraints of how system can be uh, placed for example if you take a intake manifold right the intake manifold size is fixed but the requirement of the intake manifold size is it should continuously vary with respect to engine speed but if you want to do that it becomes highly complex so what engineers have done is they have fixed the design size of the intake manifold let's say let's call it as an oil size right so it means once it's fixed the camshaft size is fixed the the stroke size is fixed the compression ratios are slightly fixed and variable too uh, nowadays there are engines with a variable compression ratio also but let's say it is fixed in a condition but with all the scenario the the engine is designed to operate highly efficient at a specific region right that region is good for the engine in that region engine consumes less energy it means less fuel and operates efficiently on the other side it also produces lower emissions okay the objective of a engineer who is designing a hybrid vehicle is tend to operate the engine within that regions Okay, which is basically in this regions in in place okay so if you operate the engine in that regions 
it means that the engine is trying to operate at its best efficiency and it is also trying to consume a very lower amount of uh, emissions also that means it is good for the uh, the economy of the vehicle it means the vehicle can give you a longer range but the problem is how do you how do you adjust or enhance or increase the torque or speed requirements within that region all right so if you want to if there is a lower torque right imagine in this region if you take this region out uh, this is a good one for the engine to operate but in this region the, it is no, it is not good for the engine to operate okay uh, let me just take another cover so it is not good for the engine to operate here or either here because the more fuel is being consumed but with a reality you have to operate the engine in this condition also all right if it has to operate in this condition then the more fuel is being consumed so what with hybrid engines we do is we take an advantage of the motor we make the motor operate here and here or support the engine to operate out of these regions but retain the engine to operate within this region as much as possible though it is highly impossible always but it is possible to an extent of percentage depending upon the degree of hybridization i'm not sure like you know it, it was kind of uh, perceived very well by you uh, if you have any questions uh, please let me know uh, i will try to address them uh, with answer <clears throat> so okay um, typically if you forget the hybrid configuration then an engine works uh, as as usual as uh, the other configurations but if you consider an hybrid configuration then there is a motor uh, there is a battery also okay there are configurations that are comes in part of the hybrids so hybrid is basically there is an engine then there is a fuel tank then there is an motor then there is a battery all right so this forms together as an hybrid engine so always when you call it an hybrid engine these components are present but the question is what is the size of the motor what is the size of the battery depending upon that we call as a degree of hybridization degree of hybridization so one is there is something called micro hybrid second one is mild hybrid third one is micro mild full hybrid and uh, the last one is uh, plug in hybrid plug in hybrid so this is the four different varieties of hybrid configurations that are present in any uh, anywhere in the hybrid uh, vehicle architectures okay or also there is one more configuration called <coughs> range extended hybrid electric vehicle okay so this is the typical varieties of hybrids that are present in any of the vehicle architectures so what is this micro hybrid i will try to uh, kind of go and explain it here so the micro hybrid configuration is that we know that the engine has starter generator so a starter so when you turn the key on there is an electrical motor that motor runs the crankshaft then the crankshaft moves the engine starts right so the same thing which is basically the uh, a motor can be called as a starter all right this starter motor is slightly made larger okay this starter motor is slightly made larger and the battery also has been added a little larger typically it's a 12 volt battery that is present in all the uh, passenger car segment 24 volt in commercial vehicle segments right so the same that battery has been slightly size larger typically we have micro hybrids the same numbers but the capacity of the battery is larger maybe the discharge current is also larger all right so then that system is being used as a part to assist the engine only in start stop the micro hybrid concept is only for a 
start and stop application it means it does not push the vehicle okay there is no movement that the motor will create for the wheels it's only the engine end of the day uh, that creates the movement for the wheels okay so this is only for the start and stop applications so then we have mild hybrid so the mild hybrid is typically we tend to position the motor by the output of the crankshaft okay if you see this is a crankshaft right which is sitting here in the engine so we connect a motor at the end of the crankshaft at the end of the crankshaft so this is called as integrated uh, that one is integrated start generator so in this condition you don't need to have another other uh, starter motor so this itself can act as a starter motor but at a given condition this motor can also move the vehicle for a next distance okay but not for too long but to a certain assisting distance then uh, we have various different configurations in hybrids one is called p0 p1 p2 p3 p4 and p5 so um this modes of hybrids tells about where do you position this motor okay where do you position this motor depending upon that position these uh, configurations are defined so uh, you can see here this is p0 which means basically like a micro hybrid configuration p1 is like this which i have shown here or here so p2 is downsized of the uh, disconnection clutch which means after the clutch okay p1 is before the clutch p3 which is basically mentioned as a part of this configuration is actually after the transmission okay and p4 is at the drive wheel p5 is at actually the wheels itself there is no interaction between the motor and the engine if it is p5 but if it is p1 p0 to p p3 there is a lot of interaction between the motor and the engine itself so again like this is a very very complex system in place it depends upon um how do you want to design a system and how do you want to control a system in place so this is like in in detail like p0 uh p1 p2 p3 or p4 all right so p5 is kind of the new one which is basically inside a wheels itself but typically today no one uh have the vehicle architecture with hybrids or no one is trying to highly focus on hybrids because it of its complexity and the cost because you need to have an engine you also need to have a battery and a motor so the engine is expensive the motor is expensive the battery is expensive the power tonics is expensive if you combine all of them together the cost of the vehicle becomes too high and it is it is comparatively like ev so why to work on some system like that so then we can have an advantage of the ev itself right that's why a lot of manufacturers have started moving towards ev completely uh, leaving hybrids but we may also still find hybrids in some applications but though largely uh, we would move towards ev in my perspective so um any questions from any of the participants uh, please do ask we don't see questions right now okay uh, anybody would like to have any questions okay so there is one question um is there any jerk that is possibly can happen with uh, ev yeah actually it is true uh, that people have experienced uncomfortable driving with ev uh, it is largely due to you know improperly tuned motor controller uh, but though if the company have done a fair job of tuning the motor controller uh, very well so nothing can happen but it is true that some vehicle manufacturers have problems with the uh, jerks but yeah as i said 
a rightly tuned motor controller will be good no problem at all okay during the rainy day is it safe to drive yeah absolutely it is safe to drive during the rainy seasons because ev components have a standard called ingress protection ip uh, they all are ip65 and above uh, all the critical systems so nothing to worry you can drive ev in the rainy seasons too all right thank you any other questions from anyone dear participants if you have any doubts kindly ask them directly by unmuting yourself okay uh what are the risks involved in a crash of an ev um okay uh it's it's slightly uh quite a question but i'm uh, trying to address um one uh <clears throat> okay if i kind of kind of come back and try to present it here uh, the manufacturers definitely take care of safety to a very highest level so there is a cell level safety i'm just giving one of the examples the, the each cell has uh protection if the cell's temperature or the cell's pressure go above a threshold value the cell itself will cut off from the circuit then we have cell interaction module protection so where if there is any short circuit between the cells in the module there is a cut off then there is a module to module safety if there is any interaction issue between the modules to module that specific module will be cut off at a larger level the battery pack also have a safety interlock at on top of this everything there is a, a contact uh, like you know the, the the triggering that happens with the the crash inputs which basically means that the whole battery pack is disconnected from the vehicle through a contactor then there is a isolation monitoring then there is a ems which take care of complete health and the state monitoring so all these mechanisms are already put in place by larger oems which means <clears throat> who are more uh, serious about bringing technology into a possibility they've already actually like you know implemented most of these things in the vehicles which kind of ensures that at an instant of crash all the there is high voltage systems are disconnected and they are separated and the, at a electrical level so that is in terms of electrical safety also in terms of mechanical safety the the design of components are ensuring that the components such as battery pack doesn't break at a very worst case scenario to that it doesn't lose its mechanical rigidity so these kind of precautions are taken in place to ensure at a cell level to a pack level to a vehicle level safety upon this if there is a still a incident then obviously there are cases where the vehicle can catch fire um uh, things leads to hazards too but though it is exactly like a gasoline engine there is a petrol tank if you hit a car with an accident 
there are chances that the tank can burst and it can catch fire like an lpg2 but though right now the technology is being in a evolution stage there are cases to you, you you do see i strongly believe 5 years down the line uh the the design and the safety would have would have been very well evolved you would see very very less cases of such incidents uh okay there's a question here which is the best designed nimble commercially available ev model as today value for money uh if i say aether has a very good vehicle design um in terms of the way it is tested way it has been uh, designed um it is being uh, potentially good in terms of its performance of what they have promised apart from ether in two in you know, i i still you know happy to not happy to see any good vehicles in the market still and any vehicle in the market do not buy when it is for first six months or first one year because even though they have tested so well there are a lot of challenges that vehicles will have so the time when they sell about like a 5000 vehicles or 4000 vehicles they would have come up with other 100 problems when the new version is released they would have fixed those issues and made the better designs so that is when you can opt to buy availability in indian market so definitely the good design is aether for two wheeler tata nexon has a very uh, good architecture and a design for a four wheeler market buses though you don't see much right now because today what you see as a bus is majorly brought and assembled from china <clears throat> even many of the two wheelers too uh it's only the branding that has been slightly changed but largely it's a assembled products majorly today even in uh six wheeler markets currently but you could see some vehicles coming down in next one or two years okay let's go to the next questions uh how many units of power is consumed for a one complete charge in ev vehicle uh mr hemant kumar it depends upon the battery pack size if you see a bike is 2.2 kilowatt battery pack size, then it may consume about 2.5 units if you buy tata nexon it will consume about 30 units at max all right 30 units is about uh 7 rupees or 8 rupees per unit it's about 180 rupees almost for a or 200 rupees for a one charge which typically gives you 250 kilometers um which is the best time to buy ev four wheeler should we buy ev or we have to wait for uh improvement or betterment i think today in the market you can slightly wait for some more time that's my uh uh approach of thinking even i'm waiting to buy a uh, next vehicle i would say ev so i'm just still waiting for some more time to uh you know uh, better vehicle to come into a market because i have a specific range requirement to travel between certain places so uh, i'm definitely waiting for the new product to come into the market maybe slightly some more time would do about a one year i think down the line and uh very new vehicle as a brand new product it definitely will have some challenges it may be even tesla too they have their own challenges in the first new models once they release a second version they would iron out their production quality and they iron out all the issues uh, you would have a better product in the market all right so uh if that's pretty much all the questions uh, i didn't have much to present in continuation i'll drop my email id here if anybody is interested you can always get in touch with us yeah 
this is uh, my email id um so you could, if you, if you have any questions or queries you can always drop your details there i would be uh, quite positive to respond back but i may i may take some time because of the current schedules i have taken 3 3 weeks of leave so i have to go back and settle a lot of things at my work so but though you can expect a reply uh, slightly in time so the battery charging of ev takes more time so how can we overcome the uh, timing uh, like a petrol vehicle i think there are a lot of ways we are trying to improve that possibility one it's it's a very largely a difficult question uh, it's a challenge to do a fast charging always because battery is very sensitive for the charging so the ideal thing is the companies are trying to look for a longer uh, range vehicle so you can charge i would say not always if you charge once maybe you can use it for 5 days or 6 days something like that but there are uh, cell level developments that are companies are trying to do it means if your cell is able to accept then you can charge right if the cell is not able to accept you can't charge that's the fundamental requirement so but the development of cell is not easy it's a very cost intensive and an expensive process and a time taking process so if you are not a manufacturer like tesla who focuses on their own cell development then it is quite a challenging thing for anyone to think about technology that have to they have to buy from other other manufacturer okay so it's like a egg and chicken um, not fully answered i do agree um swapping is a great option i think i addressed that question yesterday it is not viable for a white board vehicles maybe right now but it is good for a yellow board like an auto or a taxis maybe for trucks or a buses okay their functionality is to stay on the road for a longer time right so the swapping may not be very very affordable or uh, physically viable to set up charging station everywhere okay so any other questions from the participants All right. So there is a uh, uh, Mr. Navin Kumar. I'm a technical project manager at the auto sector. I have done projects for Maruti. My I want to change my domain to be uh, Mr. Navin. I think we we get a similar inquiries from all the OEs. Uh, we have helped people with ten fifteen years of experience to transition into uh, EV sector. Maybe we can get in touch with us. I will definitely try to uh, suggest a possibility. um and how i can uh, possibly give a direction uh, for the question which you have asked for so because it's a quite common thing nowadays that a lot of companies are asking their employees to upskill to a ev uh, we have been interacting with major oems uh, at uh, even tier 1 and tier 2 suppliers or even at oes uh, to to migrate to a ev technology and upskill themselves to into ev um we have done even c level uh, trainings for uh, executives to manage projects and uh, handle technological activities so definitely we can throw some light on the experiences we have thank you very much ravin kumar Yes, sir. thank right. you, sir. Uh, thank you, Surat sir, for a wonderful session. So, the uh, Surat sir has taken uh, two sessions uh, from day one and day two. In on day one, uh, they have taken a uh, session on uh, e-vehicles, introduction to e-vehicles, and today uh, they are taught uh, taken session about uh, hybrid and electric vehicles. So, they have delivered both the sessions very neatly, and hope uh, all our participants uh, has enjoyed the lot. of their session and within their busy schedule and they are also not feeling well and all, in all those critical conditions also 
they are managed to deliver two sessions successfully so we are very thankful to surat sir for their uh, wonderful uh, uh, talk and also wonderful sessions that they are managing you so i the whole heartedly thank to the uh, surat sir for their wonderful sessions Japan. and uh, being our resource persons here so thank you very much sir to be here so i wish very successful life ahead from our uh, institute and from our uh, participants sir sir thank you sir thank you so much thank you very much everyone thanks a lot sir for giving the opportunity to present and uh, share some of the knowledge which we have i believe it motivates everybody uh, i believe uh, it would bring some and like uh, a look forward opportunity for research and engaging students to support them to do projects uh, at their institution levels too thank you very much everyone uh, for for giving us an opportunity to present and thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you so much so thank you it's a uh, information to participants next session will be at 11:45 am by mr hanish km about uh, hybrid electric vehicles kindly i request all of you to join by 11:45 am thank you